Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone joining us from across the world. Thank you so much for joining us today for the next webinar in our Consumer Healthcare Training Academy webinar series, 2022 and beyond, where we've been deep diving into the foresight of health and wellness with incredible industry experts, creating discussion and debate, expanding our knowledge to grow ourselves and our businesses. Today, we are excited to talk about a hot category in the consumer healthcare space, probiotics. We will discuss and learn about new horizons for probiotics and bacteria-based biotherapeutic products from Ines Martinez. Before we start, I would like to encourage you to expand your mind and think about these four questions while listening. What excites you? What concerns you? What would you like to know more about? And what ideas come to you while listening to our presentation and discussion? And please feel free to pop these questions, ideas and thoughts in our chat box. Our thought leaders will answer your thoughts and questions during and towards the end of our session. Now, let's welcome our speaker and host of the day. We have Ines Martinez, a wonderful guest speaker. Ines is working as an R&D manager for the health and nutrition division at SACO System, an international biotech hub for food, nutraceutical and pharmaceutical innovations. And next we welcome our hosts, Dave McCocken, our senior associate at the Consumer Healthcare Training Academy and storyteller at Bibliosexual. And last but not least, Steve Sowby, the founder of X Potential and co-founder of the Consumer Healthcare Training Academy. Now, without further ado, please welcome Ines, Dave and Steve to the stage. Thank you so much, Emma. Hi. Oh my goodness, that's new. Oh, now we have, oh, that's uh, new. we have clapping. Very good. Thank you so much, Emma. Thank you. And welcome, Ines. It's such a pleasure. To have thank you. you here. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. So thank you very much for inviting us to present uh, the webinar series. Yeah, it's, uh, it is. And, uh, you know, I was just I was just looking at the participants and I, uh, I'm going to pull out one name from the participants. Uh, Pete Detmar. Uh, Pete, so lovely to have you here because the story of probiotics for me started with Peter when we were together at Reckitt and Coleman and we were developing a probiotics for anti-diarrheal, for traveler's diarrhea. And I remember at the time, that must've been about the, uh, the mid nineties, that we were told by our board members, why are you working on probiotics? No one is going to want to put live bacteria in their bodies. Mm -hmm. And now the rest is history. And it's just amazing. And I'm so happy that uh, within us, we're going to be talking about not the past, but really the future, which I think is very interesting. Dave, please. Yeah, it's an interesting subject. I'm looking forward to it. My own little backstory, Steve and Ines, is that uh, my first job when I left high school was to work in what was then the very first commercial yogurt factory in Australia. I was 17 years of age, and on my second day, the foreman that I had to report to, and I was just a labourer in the factory, obviously, but the foreman I had to report to took me to the laboratory where the guy in charge of the laboratory of this factory started to explain to me what the makeup of yoghurt was and what this thing called probiotics was, and I was bored brainless. It was like, just <laughs> I'm just here to make money so I can go to the pub on Friday nights, right? Uh, hopefully, over the years, I've learned a little bit more, but I'm really excited because, you know, it's a funny thing. In a, since we started talking about doing this session, so many things, it's, it's, it has happened. So many different conversations I have, so many different things happening in my personal life, but also in my professional life, projects with Steve and other things. Probiotics is just coming up like every day. Um, yeah. It's such a hot issue at the moment or a hot subject. So I'm looking forward to this. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And I can tell you, I think uh, the discussions that we're having today about probiotics are very different to the ones that we will have in a few years because uh, the field 
is changing. And I think we're at the start of what I call a revolution <laughs> in yeah. this sector. I really believe in that because when we talk about probiotics these days, we're talking uh, either about food or about food supplements. Um, so uh, basically where we would say, look, it's safe, it's non-systemic, it won't harm you. So yes, go ahead, take some probiotics. There's a little bit of proof here and there. It's growing, but it's not going to do you any harm. But I think the, the chapter that you're going to really open up for us, Ines, is really the future where we have uh, real clinical evidence and new strains that are really going to start to be impacting uh, health conditions uh, yes. and being used in a more medical way. And I'm very excited in that because I'm thinking about if we can influence conditions through a medium which is non-systemic and relatively uh, safe compared to many of the chemical pharmaceuticals that we ingest, wow, this starts to open up the world to some real really exciting developments in healthcare. Yes, there has been really great science taking place in the last years. And this is now going to have a big impact on, on what will be on the market, uh, both for new bacteria that are coming, but also for what we call traditional probiotics as well. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. So Ines, uh, maybe you can share your screen and guide us through your yes. presentation. And Dave and I, of course, will jump in from time to time with thoughts, questions, and uh, will be, uh, of course, inspired by some of your content. And again, I underline that, please, if you have any comments, questions, please put them in the Q&A or in the chat, and we'll be sure to address those as we go through the webinar. So, Ines, please, off you go. Yes. So thank you again for inviting us to present on this very exciting topic of probiotics and the future of probiotics and bacteria-based products. And thanks everyone uh, that has joined. I hope you enjoyed the talk. Uh, okay, so I will start out with uh, a few definitions. Uh, this is important because um, you will see there's a, a lot of terminology uh, for some aspects. So it's uh, important to be clear of what we're talking uh, when we use a uh, certain language. Uh, first of all, I think this is something that everybody is uh, acquainted mm. with, but uh, let's start with probiotics. These are live microorganisms that when administered in adequate amounts confer a health benefit on the host. And this is an official uh, definition um, from 2001 from WHO and, and FAO. Uh, another term that I will use throughout the talk is next generation probiotics. There's not an official definition here. And you may have also heard of these bacteria as simply anaerobes, strict anaerobes, commensal symbionts. Uh, there's a lot of uh, words uh, used uh, for this kind of bacteria. Uh, but I liked uh, what uh, Paul O'Toole and his colleagues uh, wrote in 2017. And it's like this group of uh, bacteria is a reasonable attempt to mark the progression from traditional microorganisms with long histories of safe use to untried microorganisms with no such historical acceptance. Mm. From a regulatory point of view, this makes a big difference. Uh, the traditional probiotics could be found in foods. Uh, there was a long history of safe use for many species in this case, we're talking about bacteria that are naturally present uh, in our bodies and, and coexist with us, uh, but they have not been deliberately administered uh, to the human population. And finally, uh, in, in this uh, area, um, I want to define live biotherapeutic products. Uh, this is uh, an official definition uh, of this kind of products proposed by the FDA in 2016. And these are biological products that contain uh, live organis organisms such as bacteria, is applicable to the prevention, treatment or cure of a disease or condition of human beings, but is not a vaccine. Mm. And here we're talking about drugs. Uh, I know most of you that have joined this webinar are interested in supplements, but the reason why we're talking about this is because these kind of products are going to drive also uh, a lot of the science um, related to bacteria and overall will benefit uh, the entire field. So also the supplement sector will be greatly benefited mm. by, by what uh, 
we consider uh, drug products based uh, on bacteria. Uh, mm -hmm. And I have to say, these, these products actually can include traditional probiotics. So if yeah. you're developing uh, a lactobacillus reuteri, uh, so a traditional probiotic in the drug sector uh, in the US under the live therapeutic products, uh, it will be included also in this category. There's other uh, bacteria-based products uh, that are important for health. These are symbiotics and postbiotics. Again, not official uh, definitions, but more or less we can define them. Symbiotics is a mixture of probiotics and prebiotics that beneficially affect the host by improving the survival and activity of beneficial organisms in the gut. And postbiotics, uh, bioactive compounds resulting from the fermentation of a matrix-like bacteria or by the lysing of bacterial cells. For the purpose of having a focus, we will only um, yeah, talk mostly about probiotics, next generation probiotics, and live biotherapeutic products in, in this presentation. Perfect. Uh, I wanted first to start uh, showing uh, data on uh, the boom that we have seen in research uh, related to the microbiome uh, and bacteria that are associated to our bodies, uh, including next generation probiotics and also traditional probiotics that are uh, natural inhabitants uh, of uh, our body. As you can see in the last 20 years, there has been an exponential uh, increase in the number of publications uh, for these uh, ecosystem bacteria uh, associated uh, to our bodies and they have been highlighted in very um, yeah, reputed magazines, scientific magazines like Nature Cell or Science, but also, uh, and this is very important, they have made it into the mainstream media uh, and publications. Uh, there's, uh, it has been featured by The Economist, it has been featured by The New York Times, and the implications of this are great because this also means an educated consumer, uh, educated uh, physicians as well, and a lot of knowledge uh, transferring uh, and uh, yeah, understanding mm. of what bacteria can do. Um, so Ines, by, yes. by, by coincidence, just by coincidence, last weekend, the number one newspaper in Sydney, where I'm living at the moment, uh, its weekend magazine had a four page okay. article about microbiomes. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing to me because my own daughter is reading it and said, have you ever heard of these Dad? Uh, yeah, it was <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's everywhere at the moment, right? Mm. Yes, yes. Yeah. And this consumer awareness and education is also setting uh, higher the bar for, for mm. the industry. Mm. Uh, and, and, and it's important uh, and it benefits everyone. So it's very exciting times. Um, yeah. I wanted just also to show figures in terms of funding uh, to these areas. So in 2020, it's estimated that uh, there was $1 billion uh, dedicated uh, to funding universities and basic research uh, in microbiome areas. And over one and a half billion uh, of funding coming from venture capitalists uh, to companies that are evolving in this sector. A lot of startups uh, in the biotech sector dedicated to these products. And then there's also funding uh, by big pharmaceuticals uh, as well that is, is not considered in these numbers. And of course, this is being reflected uh, in the output, in the research output uh, mm. that we're seeing. Um, and also I wanted to mention uh, over 150 ongoing clinical trials last year uh, to bacteria uh, therapeutics. Yeah. Ines, I was just wondering, uh, uh, not that uh, I would expect an answer, but I was just thinking this sounds a lot, but if we, if we looked at the comparative uh, funding and clinical trials in, say, new chemical entities, NCEs, the pharmaceutical, mm -hmm. the traditional pharma approach, I suspect that we're still a long way behind what's sure. happening in that area. And I think that's such a lost opportunity because if we're going to get uh, the live biotherapeutic products at the level where we can have doctors and pharmacists uh, to prescribe and to recommend them, we need the data. 
-hmm. We need the data. We're not going to get it on the basis of a consumer awareness. We're going to need to have medically sound and publications in the medical journals. Yes. Um, yeah. Tell me what you think about that. Uh, I think actually that these numbers, uh, they mostly reflect the fact that we're at the start of mm. translating uh, this fundamental research being done mostly at universities uh, to now uh, products. So I foresee that if we, uh, yeah, this is uh, the graph uh, on research, but if we're talking about translation to application, we're probably over here, we're at the start of the exponential uh, yeah. growth of this. Yeah, yeah. So definitely something which maybe in the next five or 10 years, we should be seeing an explosion. For sure. Yes, yes, market. yes. I hope yeah. we can do a, a recap in 10 years and see definitely, if our definitely. predictions were. We'll, we'll book you already for 10 Perfect. years. Time and we'll see Perfect. If it, uh, so that's it. Uh, 2031, you'll be here. In awesome. There, <laughs> Very good. Please continue. Yeah. Um, yes. So what has uh, propelled all this research uh, and funding, uh, bacteria are not new to us. And the concept of bacteria associated to disease or bacteria transforming food is uh, something that uh, is a concept or an intuition already from very ancient times. Uh, but it was only at the end of the 1800s that there was um, the discovery and started of isolation of bacteria. Uh, little by little, more bacteria started being discovered, isolated studies, their benefits um, were uh, understood. We consumed them uh, in fermented foods, for example, and the research also focused on that. But what changed the game uh, in terms of probiotics as supplements was actually having a formal definition uh, for probiotics and regulatory frameworks that uh, allowed this kind of products uh, to start being uh, on the market in a, let's say, regulated systematic way. Uh, and now in 2016, um, the FDA worked on this guideline for live biotherapeutic products. So you, we will see a second wave uh, of products and, and interest and growth of this sector. In 2019, it's not in this uh, paper yet, but in 2019, there was also uh, work done in the European Union for uh, live biotherapeutics. Uh, so basically uh, the regulatory framework being there uh, was necessary for this industry uh, to develop and go from the food to the supplement. Uh, but the research was propelled um, by technological advances that allowed researchers to investigate um, our microbiome uh, to a level of detail in terms of who is there, uh, what are the genes, what are they doing, um, and also in terms of uh, output. So uh, with this technology, it was affordable to screen thousands and thousands and thousands uh, of people and start understanding uh, a lot uh, about this ecosystem. So it was the combination uh, of these two factors mainly that uh, have opened the doors for what I call the new horizons mm -hmm. uh, for probiotics and bacteria-based biotherapeutic products. Um, as I was uh, saying earlier, I think we will see a, re a revolution uh, in the field and we're moving from uh, traditional probiotics, uh, mainly uh, not limited to the ones I have put here, but mm -hmm. mainly belonging uh, to this genera. So the lactobacilli or former lactobacilli, the bifidobacteria, the streptococci bacilli. Uh, and now we're going to a world of huge diversity uh, with a lot of interesting uh, candidates for therapeutic applications. Uh, I have put here a very short list uh, mm -hmm. of species, uh, including the ones that actually we started hearing from uh, earlier on. So yeah, 10, 15, 20 years ago, a Carmansia musinifila, Anaerobutilicum halli, previously known as Eubacterium halli, Coprococcus commis, Eubacterium rectali, Fecalibacterium prosnitsi, Rosburias, Prevotella, but everybody that has been, or anybody that has been following the literature knows that 
every week there is a new species <laughs> that you will hear yeah. from that has potential uh, uh, for interesting products and is interesting therapies uh, to be uh, developed. And this also gives uh, a lot of opportunities uh, because um, companies can differentiate themselves in the type of products, in the type of target. Uh, so it's very exciting also from that end. Uh, and uh, all this research uh, that has been done uh, has also contributed to a big wealth of mechanistic insight. But as I was saying uh, previously, it's not only beneficial for this new bacteria uh, that we're now starting um, to see and, and develop, but also for our old friends, uh, mm -hmm. the, it has raised the bar of um, what we need to show of what we can show. Uh, the consumer is aware, they are educating themselves, uh, they read about it and um, more and more we need more data, more studies uh, to back up uh, our products. Yeah. And uh, just on these new uh, bacteria yes. um, and new candidates that are coming in us, I mean, uh, do we know for example, we know more or less we can estimate how many bacteria are on or around or in the human body. Uh, and there's some charts, which I think you're going to show later on just to, mm. uh, uh, to illustrate that. But do we know that, uh, you know, every person will have an X number of species or geni genus of, uh, of bacteria in them? And therefore, we have to go to different, um, uh, different people, different nationalities, different cultures. To, to really find new and different species? Yes, for sure, for sure. Um, our li lifestyle is a big determinant of the bacteria that we are associated with. There's a lot of work that has been done looking at populations that live a traditional uh, Neolithic type uh, lifestyle, uh, still hunter-gatherers, for example, mm -hmm. where their microbiomes are um, quite different in some ways uh, mm. to uh, Western uh, microbiomes uh, to the point that if we consider that these bacterial populations co-evolved uh, with us and formed these populations to have benefits uh, mm. for the host, um, yeah, uh, we have uh, done a lot of changes uh, uh, throughout our history, especially our recent history uh, with the changes in diet the changes in uh, hygiene practices that have had an impact on the, the diversity. So the number of species that we are associated to and also the, the type of bacteria that yeah. we are associated to. Yeah. yeah, so I was just thinking that, you know, when we get to the full extent or potential of this, we could even be personalizing the bacteria for your lifestyle. So if I'm vegan, then there would be a certain population of bacteria that would give me the benefits that would be, say, different from someone who was uh, more carnivorous and mm -hmm. therefore maybe needed other bacteria. So this element of personalization could be very interesting going For into sure. the future as well. For sure. And not only in terms of those broad categories, but when you're talking about therapeutics, uh, mainly now I'm talking about hospital settings and let's mm -hmm. say uh, important diseases or important uh, treatments that a patient could be undergoing for which uh, the, the microbiota could be compromised. Uh, even at that level, the personalization will be to the individual. Um, wow. pro yeah. So, very, very exciting. For sure. <laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah. Okay. I'm, um, I'm imagining so as you say that, that uh, because I, I was hearing about, about this in relation to uh, somebody I know in Australia and they were being told about their own microbiome and, and what, what they need to balance out some stuff. And I'm picturing that in the future, you know, how we know what blood type we are, you know, it'll be like, oh, okay, but I'm also, my microbiome profile is X, Y, Z, right? And mm -hmm. it's, yeah. it's going to become like the thing we carry on our yeah. like phones and yeah, our ID exactly. cards or something. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, well, it's and, like, yeah, sorry, Ines, please. Yeah, and then if, uh, besides the, the bacteria and the taxa themselves, then there's all the genetic potential. And yeah. there, there can be uh, redundancy in functionality uh, mm -hmm. across bacteria. Uh, so also from this point of view, a personalized approach to the 
pathways that are missing not not only mm. the bacteria but which genes uh, are needed for the ecosystem to be restored for mm. uh, a treatment to be more effective wow. uh, we're talking of uh, a few years ahead yeah. here yeah, yeah. 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 Well, for sure. when we do when we do the 2031 session. Exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah, we'll be a lot closer to it, but let's go. But carry on, please, Ines, carry on. Okay, uh, areas of interest include uh, oncology, and I have a couple of examples about that later in the presentation. Mm. Gastrointestinal and oral health, infectious diseases, uh, central nervous system, cardiovascular health and metabolic disorders. There's a lot being explored in this area as well. Immunology, of course, reproductive health, skin, uh, because uh, initially the field of the microbiome was started with the gut microbiome, but now there's also the skin microbiome that is very important, uh, the vaginal microbiome, the oral microbiome. So yeah, lots <laughs> of potential applications and potential bacteria uh, to exploit for therapeutic purposes. Uh, without going into detail into every single or all these uh, detailed categories of application within these macro categories, uh, you can see um, antibiotic associated diarrhea, clostridiolis, difficile infection, constipation, inflammatory bowel disease, traveler's diarrhea in infants is also a lot being done uh, for necrotizing enterocolitis, sepsis, infant colic, uh, everything that has to be, that is related to allergies because of the link of our bacteria uh, and the immune system, asthma, uh, atopic dermatitis, uh, and um, many other conditions also for the gut brain axis, um, mental health, uh, anxiety and stress, but also diseases such as Parkinson and Alzheimer are also being explored uh, for with a biotherapeutic based on bacteria. So what are the hurdles uh, to market for next generation probiotics? It's important to mention that at the moment, uh, there's no products uh, on the market for these uh, new kinds of bacteria that are being studied. Uh, and this is because uh, on the one side, re regulatory hurdles, but as also we will also mention some points on technological hurdles. From the regulatory point of view, uh, we can say that the lack of a global probiotic regulatory framework is something that is also applicable or will be applicable uh, for this next generation probiotics. Uh, another challenge is that because there is a lack of history of safe use of uh, these bacteria, um, regulatory agencies across the world will not work based on positive lists uh, of species of bacteria that are approved and basically require very little safety assessments, but it will have to be done uh, on a strain basis, especially in the first years until uh, regulatory agencies become more confident that these kind of uh, therapies are safe, even if we have these bacteria normally associated uh, to our bodies and our gut, uh, there, it will be strain-based uh, at the start. Uh, another important thing, and this applies most when, mostly when we're talking about uh, LBPs, so drugs, is that bacteria ain't no drugs. And uh, a lot of agencies base, uh, when it comes to regulation, they base the criteria on what they know about drugs and, and what has been done so far about drugs. But these kind of products are very, very different for many reasons. Uh, we're now talking about live uh, biological entities and very importantly, with multiple modes of action. So when you have to approach the efficacy of your product, you could be looking at many mechanisms uh, mm. that are taking place and may, you may have uncovered one or two, but. Uh, there could be others at play that uh, are important. Another important point, and Steve, you were also already mentioning uh, this, is that the product is not intended to reach our systemic circulation. And for drugs, a lot of the safety analysis that is done is on how long uh, the molecule stays in the system, what are the levels uh, of uh, these external molecules that uh, are not toxic uh, and what are the kinetics of it. Here we are talking about bacteria that 
should stay in our gut that will produce metabolites, may, maybe many, uh, that can have an effect, uh, a systemic effect for us and trigger different systemic functions. But at the end of the day, a lot of what? The targets that you're screening for, it's even our own markers, right? Our own biology that is being affected by this bacteria. Then we have the fact that we're talking about very complex interactions between the host, the microbiome, uh, and LVPs or NGPs, or even uh, the standard probiotics in which the host has an effect on, on these bacteria. Mm. The bacteria have an effect on the host. The microbiome that we have will also have an effect uh, on whether this bacteria will be able to colonize permanently or not, on whether uh, there will be active or more active. So it's uh, very, very complex. But uh, in this sense, even you know, people respond to drugs in a different way. So the drug uh, host interaction, I think, is uh, important uh, in many cases. Here we have also a third uh, player as well. And finally, in some cases, and mm. I'm just talking about some cases, there can be uh, a difficult or not complete translation between what happens in animals and, and what happens in humans, just because yeah. we're, if we're dealing with a bacteria that is uh, autochthonous to the human host, the effect that it may mm. have on an animal could be different than what it will have uh, on, on us. On us. Ines, um, it sounds like one of the challenges is uh, the regulatory frameworks, the regulatory mm -hmm. authorities. Uh, we need to start looking at this area differently from drugs, because you said bacteria ain't no drugs. They're very mm -hmm. different. They operate in a very different way. There is elements of safety, uh, which are very different. Uh, uh, yet, on the other side, you have a lot of complexity and regulatory authorities like to be very precise in terms of mm -hmm. how things work. And yeah. it's very difficult with some probiotics or LBCs to define exactly how they are working in this very complex environment. Yes. Um, yes. What could be an answer? Uh, do we need to reinvent the regulatory process when it comes to the approval for some of these new LBPs? I, I think at the end of the day, and there's already some precedent uh, for this. Can you hear me? Yes, well, absolutely. Okay. Uh, um, is uh, the fact that if they work, <laughs> it will be more maybe on following markers of health uh, that are well known on the uh, efficacy of these products. And mm. at the end of the day, there has to be uh, a switch in, in the way that these agencies uh, think about it. And I will talk later about fecal microbial transplants, but this is uh, a good example uh, of uh, things that, or a therapy that was not being used, but being so successful mm. that it was approved. And it still can have some risks, uh, but the benefits are, are really, really uh, yeah. great. Yeah. No, I'd love to see that case study mm. again. I know of, uh, we've talked about it before, but that's really interesting. Mm. So let's, uh, let's move on. Okay. Okay. So, uh, well, the lack of precedent. So things will become easier as there will be more products on the market. There will be late paths uh, for companies to follow. Uh, and also this is uh, not such an um, maybe important point, but the restriction on, on allowed claims, at least uh, for the supplement sector, could have some implications. Although here, I think the educated public can bypass uh, this uh, issue as well. In terms of the path to market, there's many <laughs> paths, uh, possible paths to market, and it will depend on the strategy uh, that the company will have, uh, what they uh, will actually uh, do. But uh, in 2016, the FDA pronounced itself saying that bacteria that have never been consumed as foods are unlikely to be dietary supplements. And this has opened, uh, yeah, some doors. Uh, a lot of people interpreting this as um, LBPs being the path to go. Uh, but here, um, as we were saying, this requires MG GMP, we're talking about drugs. Uh, investigation on a new drug uh, path will be needed, uh, but uh, also uh, the path that if they have to first be consumed as food, so first register uh, as a food ingredient and then 
go into the supplement uh, sector. Mm -hmm. uh, they could fall within the medical foods, the foods for special dietary use. And in Europe is not different or not very different to this. It's just some of the terminology um, is different. What I wanted to point out again is that in Europe we have uh, a positive list uh, of uh, species that are qualified yeah. with presumption of safety and it makes uh, the path uh, to market very straightforward. In this case, this is not going to be allowed uh, or it's very unlikely that it will be allowed um, at the early stages. So there is uh, the route of novel foods. So basically foods that have never been consumed before, uh, this kind of registration to enter the supplement uh, sector directly. Okay. Uh, special foods for medical purposes, medical devices, cosmetics, and also uh, LBPs, with the difference that LBPs in Europe do not have a specific regulation, uh, but they are regulated uh, within the biological medicinal product uh, regulation. And the, there was a document issued by uh, the European Union in 2019, and that mainly has two chapters and they address uh, the microbiological quality uh, of the product as well as the quantification of the target bacteria in the product. Okay, so the important point that I wanted to highlight is this strain-based need uh, registration uh, that of course makes the path to market uh, longer uh, from a regulatory standpoint. Yeah. I think mm. it uh, really underlines the importance for, for companies that want to bring products onto the market that they have to have and work very closely with the regulatory team in their, yes. in their organization and have a very clear regulatory strategy exactly. uh, for entering the market and then developing the claims and benefits uh, uh, with that. So regulatory becomes incredibly critical in the success of new products in this yeah. area. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and then the kind of information that will have to be provided uh, for, let's say, the safety or risk analysis of the LBP or the NGP um, is having information about antimicrobial sensitivity, potential of gene transfer, virulence profile, viral translocation potential, biogenic amine production, metabolic capacities, uh, then um, some... Um, risk analysis related to the process, to the manufacturing process, making sure that it will be safe uh, yeah. and to the final product. But the important thing is that there will be work needed in vitro, in ex vivo, and also in animal models to do tox and safety assessments. For mm -hmm. LBPs in particular then, because we're talking about uh, patients, there will also need to be uh, very, good uh, screening done uh, from the patient side, uh, understand the target population, the mode of action, the dosage, the route of administration, also if it could uh, enter in conflict with uh, some medication, with some pathologies. Uh, so it's, uh, but this is also because it's uh, the pharmaceutical uh, yeah. route. Um, but in, in terms of uh, the clinical uh, testing uh, for LBPs, but also for NGPs, um, the first phases of clinical testing will be needed. So the phase one, uh, including uh, small groups of healthy subjects to do safety uh, evaluation and dosage, I will show of uh, some bacteria that have already, um, for which uh, this kind of work has already been done to establish uh, their safety. Um, small patient group uh, pr for primary endpoints, uh, but even for NGPs uh, also um, larger studies uh, in healthy individuals uh, as well uh, to check uh, primary endpoint uh, efficacy. Um, here maybe more talking about uh, LBPs alone, but the phase three studies in larger patient groups for efficacy, side effects and benefits. And finally, after approval, a surveillance program uh, to make sure about the safety in the long term. This, of course, means uh, very high costs, and that's why LBPs are mostly being developed by the pharmaceutical sector, I would say. Um, but also uh, a big benefit for 
the entire field. And uh, I've said this <laughs> before a couple of times already, but even traditional probiotics will benefit from all these studies, from yeah. making sure that we know that uh, they are safe. Uh, also, traditional probiotics will go under the route of LBPs. There's already uh, some uh, work being done uh, for some lactobacilli and for some bifidobacteria that are entering this route. And this will only make yeah. the sector stronger. It raises the bar for everything. Yeah, right? yeah. 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 yeah but also the a... confidence, right? Yeah. Of... Well, that's what I mean. It raises, yeah. the more detailed it is, the more science, then hopefully people sort of buy into the fact. Yeah. Yeah. And, and for me, it, it brings on the medical community with who, um, you know, having talked with many doctors, they, they, they do see probiotics uh, having a role, but because there is a lack of data around it, and of course, a lack of regulatory uh, support, uh, then they tend to be cautious, even though they somehow know it's not, you know, the traditional probiotics I'm talking about mm -hmm. now, Ines. Uh, they know that there's not going to be safety issues uh, in general, uh, yet they are sort of holding back from prescribing or recommending because mm. we don't have this. And I think this is what will come with the LBPs. It will yes. make it, yeah. Yes, I have to say that there's several, uh, several, many <laughs> probiotic strains for which there are, there is a big body mm. of literature uh, regarding efficacy, not uh, every strain that you have of the on the market, but many uh, mm. strains do have this. Uh, of course, when you're talking about uh, all this work uh, that has to be done, all this investment uh, for a product that is a supplement versus a product that is a drug with the cost that then all this work has and uh, the lack of possibility in, in the supplement sector to have uh, certain claims, even when you have uh, some good data, of course, you have mm -hmm. maybe not gone to a phase four, um, but many studies in phase two showing showing uh, very good results. Uh, yeah, let's say it's uh, <laughs> discouraging uh, to a certain extent exactly. uh, to spend many, many millions of uh, euros or dollars uh, to have the full um, package. Yeah. So that's why um, the pharmaceutical sector now developing this product, in the end, it, it will translate in, in having uh, more information. Uh, and uh, like you both were pointing out, mm. uh, raising the bar and, and benefiting the entire sector. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, so besides the hurdles to market related to regulatory, there's also technical and technological uh, hurdles. Uh, first of all, for anybody uh, in the audience thinking about uh, developing um, these uh, NGPs, uh, I encourage uh, that the selection is done not only on the clinically relevant uh, features of the bacteria, but also um, features that are uh, important for industrial uh, manufacturing or you know even in the lab you can screen uh, some bacteria and you have one that does the job a bit better um, but you see that it doesn't grow very well mm. <laughs> that's already a very good indication <laughs> that maybe <laughs> that bacteria uh, has some specific needs uh, that are more difficult uh, to be met it's yeah. likely to translate uh, industrially, not always. It, is, it could be also meaning that then in the body, uh, it, will, it may be also uh, more demanding. Uh, but let's say the, something that is more clinically uh, relevant in the lab, then when you start taking into account the yields that you can get uh, at the industry may not be the most competitive uh, yeah. strain to have. Uh, these bacteria are used to um, having a lot of uh, nutrients uh, provided by the diet, provided by um, host metabolites, and also by cross-feeding of these bacteria um, between each other. And they have specific growth requirements that, of course, when you move to the industrial uh, sector, you need to find ingredients that can satisfy the these requirements 
these nutritional needs, but also that they have the certifications, that they're food grade. So there is a lot of work to be done uh, on this end from the industrial point of view. Um, the next point is, uh, I think, a no-brainer, the oxygen sensitivity. Although here I can say that there's a wide range of flavors uh, in how oxygen sensitive the strains can be with strains that yeah, dive uh, several docks uh, in viability in 30 minutes, one hour to others that actually are not that sensitive. And a challenge uh, here is the vast diversity of species that we're talking about. Everybody wants to have uh, not just its own strain, but also its own species. And when these products come uh, to the industry, then you know you have to get the know-how uh, from from the very start uh, for for each uh, of these bacteria. And then, uh, of course, traditional probiotics, although they're in the market as supplements since the early 2000s, they have been uh, manufactured for the food industry for many decades. So there is a lot of know-how for them. For this kind of bacteria, we're only now starting uh, to get our hands uh, in them. So uh, yeah, also uh, a lot of things to, to understand and, and learn and the future will be easier from a regulatory but also a technological point of view. And in the final part of my talk, I want to talk about the science behind it and why we are excited. A few things that we can say about the microbiota and here I want to be quite fast because I'm sure most of you have already mm -hmm. read this <laughs> uh, yourselves is that, well, the microbiota, the human microbiota uh, are the microorganisms that are associated uh, to our body um, that we can consider ourselves uh, half eukaryotic and half bacteria in terms of the number of cells uh, that the bacteria associated to our body uh, make up in comparison to our own. Uh, and that from a genetic point of view, we're actually highly outnumbered. Uh, we can consider ourselves only 2% human and 2% uh, 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 prokaryotic or, or bacteria. Yeah. Each body site will have its own uh, associated uh, microbiota and, and species uh, with the gut being the one with the most diversity, maybe um, 100, 150 uh, different species or, uh, and then a lot um, of more strains uh, in each of us. Uh, but something that maybe not uh, most of you may know is that the microbiome is stable, is resilient, and is personalized. And what this means is that it's in a state of homeostasis. Um, there is uh, external factors that can affect its composition, like diet, but they will be short-lived. So if you are consuming uh, a specific fiber that your bacteria can ferment in your gut, uh, these bacterial populations can be enriched. As soon as you stop, the microbiome go, will go back to baseline. So it's uh, resilient, uh, but it's also personalized. Each of us um, has its own microbiota that will change in adulthood. Uh, well, throughout our period, our lifetime, uh, of course, from babies to adulthood to uh, the elderly, um, but within um, a few years uh, time frame, unless there has been uh, some very bad perturbation to the ecosystem, like a very aggressive um, drug or um, antibiotic therapy, uh, each of us will maintain uh, its own fingerprint uh, to mm. the point that if I would uh, collect samples uh, from each of us today, knowing who they come, they are coming from and make a profile. Uh, and then next year I collect samples again, this time without knowing who they come for, from, I could, uh, with the data from the previous year, yeah. uh, tell uh, who the sample uh, belongs to.
Wow. So your microbiotic fingerprint. Yes. Yeah. There was you. even a CSI episode with oh, that. Oh, was there? Yes. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yes, seriously. I think I remember seeing that, right? Yeah. 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 Interesting. <laughs> right, yeah. then it must be, it's, it's going to be part of daily life in a few years. That's yes. definitely true. Okay, I'm just conscious of time yes. also, Ines. Uh, so please carry on because I know there's some really interesting cases. Okay, yeah. Uh, so there's uh, our microbiota does amazing things for us. It prevents infections in different mm. ways by competitive exclusion, by uh, making some uh, antimicrobial um, molecules. Uh, so it really is important to for our health in this from this perspective. It also trains our immune system from early age. And this, uh, there's a lot of data uh, about mm. this. And there's important windows of time for the training of the immune system to take place and, and the right bacteria to be there, to be done in a, in a, in a correct way. And they also uh, generate uh, key metabolites uh, that have a protective role for our health like short-chain fatty acids, glutarate is uh, the one that everybody knows about. So it's protective against colon cancer, uh, but all these uh, short-chain fatty acids have a lot more functions uh, systemically. They are regulating um, our metabolism from uh, adiposity to our uh, brains. And then they also produce vitamins and, and other compounds that are uh, relevant for yeah. our health. Despite that, we see more. We see uh, the studies where the microbiota is basically implicated in so many uh, different diseases, from metabolic uh, diseases like uh, obesity, atherosclerosis, or diabetes, to also inflammatory bowel disease and so forth. And and the question is why. Um, and this is uh, likely because of uh, disruption to this homeostatic state re uh, resulting in a variant composition of our microbiota. Um, everything that we do will have an impact on these bacteria from the feeding regime at birth to uh, the delivery mode to our diet to whether we exercise. Um, the antibiotics that we take affect our microbiota our own uh, immunity uh, will affect our microbiota. There can be some genetic uh, issues that have an impact on the microbiota. And there has been, um, uh, yes, uh, astounding link between inflammation and composition of the gut microbiota. Here, it's important to say that it's by, by bidirectional. You have the microbiota uh, being altered by inflammation itself. And the inflammation, the consequences of the micro, the altered microbiota can also uh, make the inflammation uh, even worse. So at the end, you have this chain of events in which this uh, feedback loop is making, uh, worsening uh, the conditions. Um, and uh, finally, I wanted to talk uh, about some success stories. I was already introducing uh, fecal microbial transplants. So for uh, C. diff, so for Clostridioides difficile associated diarrhea, um, a large percentage of us is a carrier of C. difficile, um, but is uh, maintained uh, in check because of our bacteria and because of what we were saying that our microbiota prevents infection. However, yeah. patients that are taking uh, big doses of antibiotics uh, and their microbiota is uh, becoming very aberrant and uh, the diversity decreases can cause the C. diff uh, to overgrow. Um, this causes severe uh, problems in, in hospital settings and it's estimated that people with recurrent uh, C. difficile infection have a mortality rate between 6 and 30 percent, but wow. has been increasing in, in recent years. Uh, then the idea came, okay, if what we have is a dysbiosis, why uh, is, are we not doing uh, transplants of fecal material from healthy donors to reestablish uh, the microbiota? And this has been incredibly successful. Uh, one single treatment having uh, increasing the survival of the patient by 80 uh, to 90 percent. And in the case where this is not successful, uh, uh, more treatments of uh, FMTs, uh, increasing the survival rate to 95 percent. 
Mm. Um, and this is the case where for regulatory agencies, the, this was a jump in, uh, in the dark, yeah. but at the end it was so successful that um, this kind of uh, therapy was, was approved. Uh, yeah. with some risks still standing. So this is uh, two cases in, in the United States. Uh, the donor microbiota had a specific E. coli uh, that caused uh, the patient, one of the patients uh, to die and the other one to be severely sick. Uh, so the path, the likely path moving forward is actually to work with defined cocktails of bacteria, including dots of NGPs. Here I have also examples of uh, the gut microbiome uh, being uh, beneficial uh, in uh, immunotherapy, in this case in melanoma uh, patients. And I don't have time to go into the details, mm. but uh, diversity of the microbiome being uh, associated with progression-free uh, of melanoma in the patients, also bacteria, there's others That's in the paper, amazing. but fecalibacterium also being uh, beneficial. And then animal studies doing, being done with donors from responders and non-responders to immunotherapy uh, in, in mice models of uh, melanoma, showing that if, there's, uh, if they were receiving the fecal matter from non-responders, the tumor size was significantly higher from from the responders. Uh, mm -hmm. Same uh, here about bifidobacterium in particular and um, anti-PDL1 uh, efficacy with uh, the mice, um, untreated mice uh, developing uh, larger tumors than mice receiving uh, the bifidobacterium therapy or the immunotherapy, oh, yes. but then the combination of the two even being even uh, more um, promising in terms of tumor volume. This has led to many, many um, trials and companies starting uh, projects and research on this on different kinds of cancer, melanoma, pancreatic cancer, renal uh, cell carcinoma, working with different strategies from FNTs and consortia to single strains. Uh, and then the last point that I wanted to mention um, is uh, although there's uh, many other bacteria that have already been shown to be safe when um, being uh, used uh, as uh, oral treatment in, so this would be a phase one uh, study. Uh, these two bacteria for which there are publications, so anaerobic Anaerobutyricum sanguini and Acarmancia mucinifida. I'm highlighting these two only because there are publications about it. Yep. For all others, they're not uh, divulging information, so uh, it's not easy to, to get all the details, but here there are some examples. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's really out there. So, yes, so uh, this is the, absolutely the right slide. So, we've arrived at the end, and thank you very much for keeping to time. Uh, but, what uh, are for you the three key takeaways? message uh, yeah. for the audience for me it's first that these are exciting times and when we see each other again in 2031 uh, <laughs> i think we will be able to discuss everything that happened in in these 10 years but there's new products that are going to be out in the market new applications new ideas new data uh, that although there are challenges that exist uh, they're not unsurmountable and that will time this will become the norm uh, as everything. Uh, and uh, an important point that I have mentioned several times is that consumers are becoming aware and educated. And, and this has an impact for yeah. everybody um, having to up the bar and, and do more rigorous work uh, in yeah. the probiotic field. Brilliant. Thank you, Ines. And thank you. It's, uh, I'm, I'm really excited. Uh, finally, uh, probiotics, where I think historically there's been records of probiotics or fermented foods uh, 6,000 years old. Finally, yeah. they are really coming of age as a really modern alternative to our uh, standard ways of uh, pharmaceuticals through these live biotherapeutic products. So um, definitely, I'll be here in 10 years time and we can be Perfect. talking much more about how uh, this has been developed. today. It will yeah, be a yeah. link to the past. <laughs> I would, yes. I'll be the link to the past in the end. Dave? Steve, uh, Steve and I will be nearly middle-aged in 10 years. Yeah, time. nearly middle-aged. Yeah. That's it, yeah. You know, we'll be looking for how all this stuff will keep us uh, uh, going in our old age. Um, 
I, I really think, again, on, on your last chart, the, the last point, this, this thing about again, the massification of knowledge around this yeah. is just so interesting to me. Um, and as Steve said, you know, we know, and I guess most people on this call, on this session know that, you know, we've been doing this for thousands of years, but it's the way in which it's suddenly just exploding in terms yeah. of tied with a bunch of other things, you know, the, the, yeah. the seeking out of natural solutions, etc. So I think it's really exciting. Um, really grateful for the explanations. Uh, I know that the charts uh, that you provided were, are going to be really helpful in the future and sort of people like me yeah. sort of figuring out how to approach some different subjects. Fantastic. So really great. Thank you very, very much. good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Right. Um, I'm afraid we won't have uh, time for any more questions, but please, I know there's a couple of questions that we haven't answered. Uh, these will be sent out together with the recording and the charts. Um, so Ines, if you, if you stop sharing, uh, then we'll have Emma uh, uh, do our, our ending, but uh, from, uh, from all of the team and uh, uh, Dave as well uh, to say thank you so much. Thank you for giving us of your, of your insights, of your knowledge, your inspiration, and uh, we will definitely be in touch. We will definitely yeah. have you back, maybe even before 2031. Okay, uh, <laughs> thank Thanks you so for much. the opportunity and the platform. Thank you so much, Ines. Thank you. Right, Emma. Oh, thank you so much, Ines, Dave and Steve for such an incredible webinar. And thank you all for joining us for this very exciting probiotic opportunity. Uh, before we close, I would love to invite you to join our next webinar, which will be under the topic of mental health, stress and healing power of nature by author and co-author of The Way, Finding Peace in Turbulent Times, Vernon Sankey and Katie Lockwood. In this fast changing world, pandemic and economic crisis in some countries, we will learn more about how to manage stress in these turbulent times. Now, finally, on behalf of the Consumer Healthcare Training Academy, I would like to invite you to find us on LinkedIn to continue this conversation and discussion. We really look forward to seeing you in August for our next webinar. I wish you a fantastic day and evening, and we will see you next time. See you later. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank bye you. Bye. Take Thank care. you again, Ines. Bye, everyone. Bye -bye.